All right, so it is 8 p.m. on the east coast of the United States. That means it's time for the Internet Bible Study. This is Chip Brogdon at the School of Christ .org, welcoming you to our series of messages from the book of First and Second Thessalonians. Tonight we are in First Thessalonians chapter two, and we began a series of teachings last week that will take us through the books of First and Second Thessalonians, which is predominantly geared towards the second return, the second coming of Christ, the return of Christ, and the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. So First and Second Thessalonians is uh, devoted to probably the most in-depth teaching on this subject, and so that's what we are we are delving into, and um, so I'm looking forward to getting into the study with you again tonight. We are in First Thessalonians, chapter two, so we'll get started there in just a few minutes. First, why don't we go to the Lord and let's pray and ask Him to bless our study, and let's also lift up any prayer requests or needs or concerns that you may have on your heart to him as as well. So Lord, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together in your name around the study of, of your word. I thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit through teaching and uh, through instruction that you would lead us and guide us and teach us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. So grant us, we pray, that spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ, that we would be no more children, but would grow up into him in all things. Uh, I thank you for strengthening us, spirit, soul, and body, and preserving us and making us whole in Jesus' name. And so whatever prayer concerns or needs that are represented, Lord, we stand in agreement and we pray for your kingdom and for your will, and for your purpose to be done in each and every situation, in each and every life, uh, that your will and not our will would be accomplished and fulfilled. Give us wisdom so that we will know how to walk worthy of you and your kingdom. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and strengthen us with might according to your power in our inner man, that we would be strengthened and encouraged in our faith and um, that we would find strength for the journey. Lord, we, we thank you for the great purpose that you have purposed in yourself to gather together in one all things in Christ, things that are in heaven and on earth, even in him. And so we thank you that you are working all things together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called, according to your purpose. And so we thank you for working all things after the counsel of your will. So give us wisdom to cooperate and to surrender our hearts, our minds, surrender our lives to you as true disciples, as faithful followers of Jesus, embracing the cross, and following in your footsteps. So, Lord, this scripture study tonight, we thank you for it and for the truth of your word. I thank you for the liberty and the freedom that we have in Christ to be able to speak the truth uh, without fear of what man will say or fear of man's opinion. We are only interested in your praise and in your glory, and in honoring you. And so I praise you together with your people tonight, and we bless you, and we glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are in agreement, say amen. And please type amen into your question box. Wonderful.
Well, it's just good to be with you. I'm delighted that you have joined us for the Thursday night Bible study. I want to welcome those of you who joined us after the introductions at the top of the hour. Uh, a couple of you, a few of you have asked about how Brittany is doing, and uh, truth is she went to the doctor today and had, had an MRI to see uh, what kind of damage has been done to her knee. She's in some pain at the moment. She's out of school, so for her that's a good thing. Uh, but we're going to just see how the next few days goes. So we appreciate your prayers. Thanks for your encouragement. And um, look forward to getting that resolved and giving you a good report as soon as possible. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And um, if, if you're joining us for the first time, the way the webinar works is I'll give a presentation from the chapter that we're studying. At the end of the presentation, I'll open it up for questions and answers and comments. So just hang on to all of those until the end, and then we'll open it up and give you the opportunity to uh, express yourself and give your feedback. Um, we, we try to go through one chapter a week, and the purpose is not to replace your own study, but to encourage you to do your own study. And what we want to do is just uh, bring out the, the main points, give you a, a overview, pull out some things that the Lord is, is showing and revealing, and hopefully will be, that will be confirmation to you and in your own study. So uh, that's the goal here, Second or First Thessalonians, the second chapter. And we're going to divide it up into the following outline. Number one, the apostolic example. Number two, walking worthy. And number three, spiritual conflict. So the topic generally of First and Second Thessalonians has to do with the second coming of Christ, the return of Christ. And actually at the moment, I'm working on a larger, more comprehensive, topical teaching that will make available soon that covers the return of Christ, the second coming of Christ of the Lord uh, that will supplement this chapter by chapter study in Thessalonians. It just seems to be the direction that the Lord is having us to go in uh, with teaching. But there's much more to that topic uh, beyond First Thessalonians. So we, we're going to approach it from a topical standpoint. And so I'll, I'll have some more information about that for you probably between now and next week. But this is good as well, and I, I like the discipline of going through the Scripture chapter by chapter. Uh, so the overall theme for Thessalonians, as I said, is the second coming of Christ. The other thing to be especially mindful of is that Thessalonians is the first letter that Paul wrote. And so the first couple of chapters are very heavily focused on the relationship between him and and the believers there in Thessalonica. And we covered some of that history and that introduction to the book last week. So if you, if you recall the page where you registered for the webinar tonight, on that same page you can get the replay from last week if you haven't listened to it already. That will give you a good introduction to the overall theme of the book. Uh, so I think for Chapter 2, Chapter 2, the main point, the main emphasis, and the main question that is being answered is how are we to walk and how are we to live as we wait for the appearing of the Lord Jesus? How are we to live? What are we to do? in the meantime, while we are waiting for Christ to return. And I think the question is answered in a way that, that maybe is not very apparent if you just read through the surface of this chapter. So what I like to do is read it. And, you know, sometimes I read the word and I see the surface level meaning and that's all I see. And then sometimes I go back and I read and I see another layer of interpretation. And, and so there's such a depth to 
the Word of God, it's important that we allow the Holy Spirit to help us to penetrate beyond just the surface level. So if you just read this on an exterior level, on just a linear, straightforward method of interpretation, it just looks like that Paul is talking about how much he loves the Thessalonians, and certainly that's included in here. But I think we're going to find that he is actually giving them an example, an apostolic example, and he is going to, to use this as a way to teach them and to teach us how you and I should be living and walking in a manner that is worthy of the Lord Jesus, in a manner that is worthy of our calling. And this is a thing that you see Paul repeating from time to time. Ephesians, I think it's Ephesians, uh, maybe it's Ephesians 3 or 4. Paul says to walk worthy of your calling. Here again, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to find him encouraging us to walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And the overall theme here is, yes, Jesus is returning. Yes, Jesus is coming back. And there is a way that we ought to conduct ourselves in the meantime. So this really is an answer to those who would suggest that all that really matters to God is what you believe. If you believe on Jesus, it really is beside the point how you live, how you walk. And so we, we want to make sure that we're not giving the wrong message to people. I am a, I'm a big believer in God's grace and God's forgiveness. And I, I offend quite a number of people because they think I should concentrate more on sin and judgment, and all the punishment and the wrath that's to come. And I, I guess it. I guess the the thing is true that is in business. If you create a product that many people love, you're also going to create at the same time a large group of people who hate it. You know, for people who really, really love what you do, there's going to be as many people who hate it. <laughs> and I think with when it comes to teaching, especially in, in the environment that we find ourselves in, everyone is a critic, everyone is an expert, and they mistake spiritual discernment for spiritual, uh, I don't know how, how to... How to, I, I'm trying to coin a word for it, Pers, persnickety being persnickety over the teaching, uh, pouring over it the way a lawyer would pour over a legal paper to try to poke holes in it and find something wrong with it so that he can jump up and down and say, oh, I found something not doctrinally correct with the teaching. And they think that's what, a lot of people think that's what spiritual discernment is. If I can just find something wrong with the teaching, poke holes in it, then I've really got spiritual discernment and I won't be deceived. And so while they are so busy trying to find something doctrinally wrong with the teaching, they miss the complete point. Um, you know, they are, they are the ones who strain out a gnat and they swallow a camel. So they might find one little thing that they don't quite understand or not quite agree with, and that gives them an excuse uh, to just throw out the whole teaching. So I, I encounter people like that when they hear me talk about grace, and they hear me talk about all things in Christ, and they think that um, I'm, I'm not properly emphasizing the other, that uh, of holiness and, and that we should um, live in a certain way. But if you listen to me long enough, and if you read enough of the things that I write, I think you're going to find that I, I try to be very balanced, but I, I'm just not going to please everybody, and really that's not my goal anyway. If you try to please everybody, you're going to end up pleasing nobody, and most of all, you're not going to please the Lord. So 
I, I'm not. I, I learned a long time ago. If I wanted to please people, I should have stayed in the pastoral ministry. Because that's all about pleasing people. And um, I just I wasn't cut out for it then. I'm not cut out for it now. So I'm I'm not aiming to please people. I want to try to give you a, a good balanced biblical and scriptural perspective on things. So I think there has been just as much emphasis in my teaching and in my writing on the fact that we don't abuse the grace of God. We don't use the forgiveness and, and love of God as a cloak for our own sinful, self-centered, fleshly activity. I think that's very clear. At the same time, I don't think that you should beat people over the head and hammer them over and over again and make them totally conscious uh, all the time of they're, they're sinful and they're self-centered and, and they've sinned greatly uh, to, the, to the point that they become uh, discouraged and they feel like that there's no hope for them. There's got to be a proper biblical, spiritual, mature balance. So when I come across an attitude that says, hey, I'm forgiven, I can do whatever I want, Jesus forgives me, I'm going to heaven when I die, so I might as well live it up now. It doesn't matter what I do, uh, I'm free in Christ, I can do whatever I want to do, then I think that kind of an attitude uh, needs to be corrected, that needs to be challenged. But when I come across a, a, the opposite extreme that says, uh, I'm a failure, I, I'll never measure up to anything, um, I, I'm no good, God can't love me for all the things that I've done, what's the use, then I think in that situation you need to remind people of the grace and forgiveness and love of God and the fact that you cannot sin so greatly and so hugely that you are beyond the mercy and forgiveness of God. Where sin abounds, what does much more abound? Where sin abounds, what abounds all the more? Grace. And that grace is something that is missing in the harlot church. I think I'm going to start calling it the harlot church. It's just such a, a good little phrase to correctly identify what and who I'm talking about. I've been in, in home group meetings and in teaching sessions where I'm talking about the church, and I mean the institutional church. I'm not talking about the body of Christ or the ecclesia or the spiritual house of living stones. I'm talking about the church, the organized religion, the religious system of our day. And I'll talk for 45 minutes or 60 minutes about the church and uh, how it has, had, how it interferes with the spiritual growth and maturity of God's people how it's a distraction and a hindrance from a Christ-centered walk, and how it's a counterfeit from what Jesus intended. And then I'll talk like that for 45 or 60 minutes, and then I've had people afterwards say, well, you shouldn't talk about the church because it is, it is God's house. And I'm thinking I must be the, the most <laughs> terrible teacher in the world if I can talk for an hour and you still don't get the difference between the religious system that was made by man, built by man, supported by man, and carrying out, being carried out by man versus the spiritual house of living stones, the called out assembly, the ecclesia, the true body of Christ. So I, I think whenever I say the word church, I need to put the word harlot in front of it. It's the harlot church, the religious system, the spiritual Babylon of Revelation. I'm, I'm telling you, it's not Babylon is not a country, it's a spirit. And it's not a worldly spirit, it's a religious spirit. And if you don't believe that, then you don't rightly discern the book of Revelation because it's all right there and it's spelled out for us. You see in the book of Revelation two alternatives, two options. It's the harlot or the bride. One is a counterfeit bride and one is the true bride. So there's the harlot church, and then there's the bride of Christ, the ecclesia, the spiritual house of living stones, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. 
Well, that's who we are. That's our true identity. Our identity is not, should not be in the religious system, not in the harlot church. But our identity is in Christ, and because we identify ourselves in him, then that means we have fellowship and unity with one another. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, it says in 1 John, then we have love for one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from every sin, from all sin. So thank God for the cleansing blood. But it also says if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. So we always need grace. We're going to need the grace of God. We're going to need the love of God. But that does not excuse any of us from walking worthy of who we are and of whom we belong to. So if you're a disciple of Jesus, there's a responsibility and there's a stewardship to walk worthy of the kingdom of God, period. There's a responsibility. You say, oh, I don't want to hear about the responsibility. I just want to hear the grace and the good news. Well, that's fine, uh, but you, you are not walking worthy. If that's your attitude, you're not walking worthy of God who calls you. And there seems to be, in, in my opinion, there seems to be an, Ill, an inability in people to be able to find the correct balance between the two extremes. Either they're resting in Christ and not doing anything to walk worthy of their calling, to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. They're either resting in Christ or they're going to the opposite extreme of religious works and fanaticism and trying to prove to God and to everyone else that they can do it longer, bigger, better, faster, more extravagantly than anyone else. Well, those are two <laughs> very different extremes, but it seems human nature, being what it is, tends to go from one extreme to the next. So I see a lot of people coming out of the, of the harlot church. They come out of the religious system. They get a little bit of freedom, a little bit of liberty. They're not under the yoke of bondage anymore to religion. And so then they go to the opposite extreme and they say, hey, I'm free in Christ. Woo, I don't have to go to church on Sunday. Woo, I don't have to read the Bible. Woo, I don't have to have a prayer life. I can just be spontaneous. And they mistake spontaneity for spirituality. And they forget all about the discipline. They forget all about walking worthy. I mean, that's what a, a disciple is, someone who, who voluntarily places themselves under a discipline, to study a discipline, to be an apprentice of a master. There's a discipline there. And when you choose that discipline, you reject every other thing that you might get interested in, all the other things that would take your time and your attention and your energy. You say, no, I'm rejecting those paths, and I'm choosing this discipline, this path, this narrow way of following Jesus, embracing the cross, and I'm, I am submitting myself to be under the discipline and the government of the Holy Spirit. But people today, they don't want to hear about that. They don't want to hear about discipline. They don't want to hear about being governed by the Holy Spirit. I want to do what I want to do. And that's the problem with the world, and it's the problem with the harlot church. It has created a self-centered attitude that everything revolves around me. Why, even God revolves around me. And God's word is there, not to discipline me or to instruct me in the way that I should go, but God's word is there to give me promises to make my life better to make me more blessed, to make me have more things. And if I don't like the way my life is going, I should be able to go to the Bible and pull out, pull out some verses and just confess these verses. And that's idolatry. That's witchcraft. That's not walking in spirit and truth. That's not being governed by the Holy Spirit. That's using... Scripture 
and using the Holy Spirit as a way to manipulate my environment to give me the things that I want. Well, that's not right either. James says, you have not because you ask not. Well, and then you ask, but you don't get it. Why? Because you're just being self-centered. Even in your praying, you're self-centered. All of that is resolved when we place ourselves under the discipline of the cross. Self-centeredness and Christ-centeredness cannot coexist. So how do we deal with self-centeredness? We deal with it by taking up the cross, denying ourself, and following Jesus, and replacing self-centeredness with Christ-centeredness. So I said all of that to say this, that there is a responsibility, there is a stewardship that we have been given, and we are, while we're waiting for the Lord Jesus to return, our responsibility is to walk worthy of God, of his calling, and to walk worthy of his kingdom. And so we'll see that as we go through Second. Thessalonians or First Thessalonians chapter two. So by now you should be there. First Thessalonians chapter two. We'll start out with the apostolic example, beginning in verse one. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated in Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Now we have already read, I think last week we said it was in Acts um, was it 17? Acts 17 is that what it was? Yes, in Acts 17 uh, we talked about how Paul came into Thessalonica. He had just left Philippi in Acts chapter 16 and he got to Philippi because he had a dream when they were in Neapolis, or um, no, it wasn't there. It was in um, Troas that Paul had a, a dream. He had a dream of a man. It's Acts chapter 16, verse, verse 9, Acts 16, 9. He had a dream, and a man in Macedonia, which is a province where Thessalonica and Philippi is located, a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And so they concluded from that that God was calling them to go into this province. And so they went, and the first place they came, they came to the largest city in Macedonia, which was Philippi. And when they preached the good news, and they cast the devil out of a demon-possessed woman, then all the people, the, the leaders, uh, arrested them, beat them with rods, and put them in jail in Philippi. And that's how their ministry began in Macedonia. <laughs> Not a very favorable or exciting start to a new ministry endeavor. So there's this other prevailing attitude out there, and I think we mentioned this last week, that if you're in the will of God, you won't have any problems, you won't have any opposition, you're just going to float around on a cloud, and every the world will be at your feet, and all the, the doors will open, everything will be smooth sailing. And if you've ever read the story of Paul's journeys and the things that Paul went through, then it, you'll, you'll recognize that that's absolute untruth. That you can be in the will of God and you can be following the leading of the Holy Spirit and especially when you're in the will of God and when you are following the leading of the Holy Spirit, you're going to have difficulty. You're going to have tribulation. Paul says that you know how we were spitefully treated at Philippi, and we were, yet we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. And we spend so much of our time trying to eliminate conflict when Scripture teaches that you're going to have conflict no matter what you do. 
So you might as well get used to it and acquiesce yourself to the fact that life is difficult. And the people who have the biggest problems in this world, it's not the people who have a difficult life, it's the people who think they're not supposed to have a difficult life, that somehow being a Christian means I'm not going to have any problems, I'm not going to have any difficulties, everything's just going to be a bed of roses for me. And if you, if you follow Jesus longer than 10 minutes, you know that's not the case, and yet that's what the Harlot Church teaches. It sets up a false expectation for people. If you come to Jesus, all your problems will be solved. Well, all their problems are not solved because the spiritual warfare begins to escalate around that person. So what does the harlot church do? The harlot church says, oh, now you need, now that you're born again, you need to get plugged into the church. Oh, now you need to get plugged into coming to church three times a week. You need to attend the new believers class. You need to come to listen to preaching. And, of course, you have to pay your tithes or your finances will be cursed. <laughs> so through fear and through this false expectation that if I just get in with a body of believers, if I just get plugged in here and just sit under the word and just listen to good preaching and good teaching, then I won't have any problems. And guess what? You do have problems. And then what, what does the harlot church say? You must have sinned. You must have done something wrong. You must have displeased the Lord in some way. You must have a spirit of rebellion. There must be something wrong with you. And it, you know, it, it happens. Uh, and, and honestly, you know, I'll be honest, it's one reason why in years gone by, I have not, I have tried not to share so much about our personal life. Because we go through some things that are difficult. And I'm not going to get into all of them right now. But in, in years gone by, I would have never shared with you anything about Brittany hurting her knee. I would have never shared anything with you about Carla breaking her back and having back surgery. I wouldn't have shared anything with you along those lines because when we have done that in the past, it's the religious spirit in people that they will write in and they won't say, be encouraged, brother, and we're praying for you. They will write in and say, you must, have been, you must be doing something wrong. Don't you believe in healing? Don't you believe in the power of God? There must be something wrong with you to have all this going on in your family. And because I don't tend to respond to those people very well, it's been easier for me just not to share my needs. Who, ne who needs negative people writing in, accusing you of doing something wrong when you're trying to, to share your needs? But I've had a, 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 an awakening since then that in the first place, they're idiots and don't know what they're talking about anyway. And in the second place, it doesn't really make any difference to me what a handful of people may think. I would rather have the people who love us and <laughs> think good things about us, praying for us, uh, than to not have that because a handful of people uh, want to be foolish. But it, that's just a small example of how the spirit of religion gets into a person, and it's very difficult to to get out of. It's very difficult to get out of that mindset. But I want you to see that Paul says, you know that how we were spitefully treated at Philippi, and yet we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. And I would suggest to you and to everyone that, that happens to be listening, who's ever been through anything that was conflict, that was difficulty, that was discouragement, I would suggest to you that it is in that very conflict that you learn the true essence of what it means to follow Jesus. Anybody can be bold to speak the truth 
when things are going good. When things are going well, it's no great thing for you to shout the victory. That's not a big test. That's not a, a great accomplishment. It is when you are in much conflict, anybody can sing hymns when they're feeling good. But when you've been beaten with rods and you're bleeding and your wounds are open and sore, and you're bound in chains and thrown into prison, what are you doing at midnight? Most people are griping and complaining and saying, I thought God called me to preach the gospel in Macedonia. Look what happened to me. But it says that at midnight they were singing hymns. And they weren't just whispering, but they were singing them loud enough that all the other prisoners could hear them. And then the earthquake happened and, and the chains fell off and, and you know the rest of the story. Oh, well, that's a prophetic illustration for you and I. Paul says it was in great conflict that we spoke the gospel of God. And it's in these great conflicts that you and I are going through. When our faith is tested and our patience is tried, that the true spirit of Jesus has the opportunity to come forth. And that's when it's real. That's when it means something. So Paul says, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. So that's the first point here in the apostolic example. It involves suffering, number one. And number two, it involves boldness in much conflict. Anybody can be bold when they feel good. Anybody can be bold when they're on top of the world. Anybody can be bold when they are popular and well-liked and well-thought-of and connected and at the top of their game. But when you come to that place of weakness and that place of difficulty and you find within yourself the Spirit of Jesus rising up and giving you boldness in the midst of your conflict, you are touching upon something that is apostolic. It is supernatural. And it is in the midst of that conflict that you're going to, to touch God and know God to a depth that fair-weather Christians will never understand or appreciate or experience for themselves. You learn something in the wilderness. You learn something in the prison. You learn something in the difficulty that you can't learn anyplace else. It gives you depth of character. It gives you wisdom and insight. It gives you persistence and perseverance. When everybody else turns back because it's not comfortable, it's not convenient for them. Paul says, preach the word. Preach the word. In season, out of season. If it's convenient or inconvenient, if you're liked or not liked, if you're popular or unpopular, preach the word. Be ready. So this is the apostolic example. And you say, oh, brother, I'm not called to be an apostle. Well, just hang on, because I, I don't think he's sharing this for the benefit of those few handful of people who think they're called to an, to an apostolic ministry. I think this has application for everybody. And yet it is only actually received and put into practice by a select few, the remnant. So the first point is suffering. The second point is boldness and much conflict. Then we keep reading in verse 3, For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. 
And he, here is a good discernment tool for you when you evaluate the ministries, the messages, the prophetic words, so-called, prophetic ministries, so-called, apostolic men and women, so-called, who are no more of an apostle or a prophet than my golden retriever, but they allow themselves to be referred to as such, and yet they don't live up to the apostolic example. They strut around like roosters on a, on a stage someplace, And that's not the apostolic example that Paul and Peter and John and the others left as what it means to be an apostolic sent messenger of Christ. Well, the first characteristic, suffering. Secondly, boldness and much conflict. Thirdly, no error, uncleanness, or deceit. Now look, we all make mistakes. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I still stand by the statement that I made a couple of weeks ago. I don't believe God has called us to sinless perfection in this lifetime. Perfection is something he is doing in us and will do for us, and we will see the fulfillment of in the next age. But in the age that we live in, it's the age of grace. And what it says is, I haven't arrived, I haven't yet achieved, I'm still pressing on towards the mark for the goal of the high call of God in Christ. And in the meantime, I'm, uh, whether I mean to or not, I'm going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. You say, oh, God has called us to be holy and to, to be without sin. Yeah, he's called us to live holy lives and be without sin. But there's also the provision of the blood of Jesus because he knows that so few of us are going to live and fulfill our highest potential and purpose in him. That's not an excuse to go out and do whatever you want to do. It just means that in spite of your best intentions, and in spite of you taking up the cross and following Jesus, you're going to make mistakes. But God's grace is bigger. That's the message. The difference is there's no error, no uncleanness, no deceit. And actually, I think it's very deceitful and very disingenuous to suggest that you're supposed to be spiritually perfect, and that's what they think holiness is. They think holiness is spiritual perfection. You never sin, you never make a mistake. Sinlessness. Well, only Jesus is sinless. And where did you get the idea that you've arrived? Show me one person who has achieved sinless perfection, and then I'll pay attention. Until then, you're just the pot calling the kettle black. None of us are without sin. None of us have achieved sinless perfection. And we're not going to in this life, not in this age. That's not God's purpose for us in this age. You know what God's purpose for us in this age is? Grow in grace <laughs> and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. God's goal for us is spiritual growth, and we can be spiritually mature. It doesn't mean that we're spiritually perfect. You're following a pipe dream, and you're wasting your time trying to achieve sinless perfection in this lifetime. This is the age of grace. It doesn't mean you go out and live any way you want to. You walk worthy of the calling. And as you take up the cross and you follow Jesus on a daily basis, you put to death the old man. You put to death the deeds of the flesh. They who belong to Christ Jesus, it says in Galatians 5, have put to death the deeds of the flesh. That's why he says, walk in the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's nothing in the grace message that gives you permission to go out and live in the flesh. It's either a lack of understanding or it's just spiritual immaturity or, or mental immaturity 
for people to take the message of grace and God's forgiveness and think that means it's okay to go out and do whatever you want to. That's just foolishness. That's not what Scripture teaches. It says walk in the Spirit. Don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap of the flesh corruption. So you should sow to the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Be governed by the Spirit. Put to death the deeds of the body. Have nothing to do with the former lusts. That's what our purpose is in this age. Not sinlessness, but spiritual growth and maturity. And that's achievable. That's something that you can achieve in this age. It's something you can achieve in your lifetime. Paul said, by this time, you ought to be teachers. You ought to be mature. Instead, you're babies. You're immature. You're carnal. You need somebody to go back and teach you the fundamental things all over again about, about the Lord Jesus. So by this time, you ought to be, and yet you're not. So that, that indicates that after a reasonable period of time, we will have attained, obtained some measure of spiritual maturity. And that's enough, my friends. If we can get people to that, if we can get people to a place of, of Christ-centered spiritual maturity, and that's our goal at the School of Christ, Christ-centered spiritual maturity. My goodness, if, if we can help people get to that, that's enough for one age. That's enough for a lifetime. Never mind spiritual perfection. It's a challenge just trying to get people to spiritual maturity. Let's just focus on the next thing. The next thing is spiritual maturity. Let's focus on the next step <laughs> to grow up. Just grow up. Never mind trying to get to this impossible dream, this pie in the sky, this theological impossibility. Uh, somehow we're going to get spirit, all of us are going to be spiritually perfected, sinless, before Jesus returns. If that's the case, then he's never going to return. And scripture says he's returning. <laughs> Oh, we just we just need to grow up. That's what we need to do. We need to grow up. Be no more children tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of doctrine and the cunning craftiness of men wherein they lie in wait to deceive. Let no man spoil you, it says, of your treasure in Christ through philosophy and vain deceit. That includes theology and these stupid teachings that pe put people in bondage. I'm telling you that spiritual maturity is all that God is asking of us in this age, and I'm also telling you that it's achievable. You absolutely can grow up in Christ. You can grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus and not be a spiritual infant the rest of your life. So verse 4, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. Have you, ever, have you ever thought about the fact that God has entrusted you with the gospel? You say, oh, but I'm not, a, I'm not an apostle. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't have a ministry. Oh, yes, you do. God has approved you and has entrusted you with the gospel. It doesn't have to be a ministry. It doesn't have to be an apostolic ministry. That has nothing to do with it. It has to do with the fact that he has given us, all of us, the ministry of reconciliation. He has approved us in the beloved, and he has entrusted us with the gospel. Now, if someone entrusts you with something, that carries with it a certain amount of responsibility. So God has entrusted us with the gospel. Paul says, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. That's some good, good stuff there. Number four, apostolic example, we're pleasing God, not man. Pleasing God, not man. This world... And the harlot church is full of a bunch of man-pleasers. 
man pleasers. I mean, the whole thing functions on pleasing man. The pastor has to please the congregation or they go someplace else. The congregation has to please the pastor or he puts them under discipline or preaches them into condemnation. Can never measure up. It's all about pleasing man. Pleasing the people who have the money so they'll give to support the harlot church. It's based on man. It's based on pleasing man. It's a business, just like any other business. And the customer is always right. you got to please the customer if you're in business. If you don't please the customer, you go out of business. The Harlot Church knows this. And so they are in the business of pleasing man. Well, you can't please man and please God. You can't serve man and serve God. That's another thing that, that gets people confused from time to time. Hey, well, if I serve other people, that's serving Jesus. No, it's not. Not always. And sometimes serving other people, because that's really what you want to do, it's really not about serving other people. It's really about serving yourself. You get a real thrill out of serving other people, and it's got nothing to do with them. It has to do with you. And that's why people find it so hard to lay down their ministry, lay down their church, walk away from their pastorate. The work of the Lord becomes more important than the Lord of the work, and they sell out. To keep it going, they have to please man, and you can't please man and please God. So I'm just speaking freely tonight. I thank the Lord for the liberty to be able to speak freely and to speak the truth. Paul gave us an example. So it's easy to point at everything that's wrong, but at the same time we focus on what is the godly example. And so far we're listing those things. I think we'll come up with nine attributes of the apostolic example before we're finished with this chapter tonight. But the fourth attribute of the apostolic example is they are pleasing God, not pleasing man. Number five, not seeking man's approval. Verse five, for neither at any time did we use flattering words as you know. Why would you use flattering words? Only if you're trying to impress and please man. So when you are only interested in pleasing God, you can dispense with flattery and pretentiousness. We didn't use flattering words, he says in verse 5, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness, nor, verse 6, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others. <laughs> so what about this? Paul says, we love you, but we're not seeking your approval. We're not trying to get glory from you. We're not buttering you up. We're not trying to flatter you. <laughs> Only a man who is pleasing God can truly love other people and serve other people without being in bondage to other people. And that's why pastors in the Harlot Church can't truly serve people. They think they're serving people, but they're doing them a disservice Because the only way you can really serve people is to put God first, to please God above others. Only then can you serve others with the freedom and the liberty that God gives so that you are really serving them and not being in bondage to them. It's a very subtle difference. And that subtlety is lost on most people. Well, this is good. The apostolic example continues. And look at this word picture that he uses. Verse 6, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. How many people today, in the name of Jesus, 
based upon their supposed position and title and alleged authority and anointing that supposedly they have, make demands upon others as the apostles of Christ, the prophets of Christ. Paul says, we, we haven't made you any demands. We might have come to you and said, well, as apostles of Jesus, this is what we say you better do. <laughs> well, that attitude is prevalent in the harlot church, but that's not the way the ecclesia operates. Instead, verse 7, and, and here, is the, here is the good example. You have to use the negative examples because that's the thing that people relate to. But here's a good example, a positive illustration that is such a contrast between the example of Paul the Apostle versus our modern-day false apostles. We were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. Does that description fit any of the apostles and prophets and pastors in the harlot church that you know of, or anywhere else, gentle as a nursing mother, cherishing her own children? Gentleness, Paul tells the Galatians in Galatians 5, gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. Those who walk in the Spirit, those who are filled with the Spirit, those who are governed by the Holy Spirit, are gentle, among other things. Gentleness. Gentleness. So one of the first clues that you can discern when discerning whether or not a person is walking in the Spirit or speaking by the Spirit of God or if their ministry is, or their church, is truly spirit-led and spirit-filled and governed by the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit will produce gentleness. They will be gentle, approachable. But the carnal and the self-centered and the fleshly find it impossible to be gentle. Paul says, we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. What a, what a neat example of the apostolic ministry. Now, don't mistake gentleness for a lack of passion, because Paul was very passionate. Paul was very excitable. So don't mistake gentleness for weakness or feebleness. Don't let gentleness give you the wrong impression of weakness, because that's not the case. But it's a spirit-inspired gentleness. Verse 8, so affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. And that's the seventh aspect of this apostolic example. They imparted more than a message. They gave their very lives. Well, anybody can put together a sermon. Anybody can get up and give a good teaching. But imparting your very life, that's a standard that, that few people, that's a price that very few people are willing to pay. So it's obvious here that he loves them, and it's obvious here that he he has their best interest and their welfare in mind more so than his own. Not only the gospel of God did we impart to you, he says, but also our own lives. And those of you who just want to rest in Jesus, you can't be an apostle. You say, I don't want to be an apostle. Well, okay. 
that's probably a good thing. One of the greatest ways to discern if a person is spiritually mature or not, you can measure it by the level of interest they have in the spiritual growth and maturity of other people. A child is pretty much concerned with their own welfare, their own well-being, but a parent is concerned with the welfare of their children. So when Paul uses the example of a mother cherishing her, a nursing mother cherishing her own children, that mother cares more about the child than she cares about her own self. And that seems like a very simple example, but it illustrates the difference between a self-centered walk and a Christ-centered walk. Because a Christ-centered spiritual maturity will naturally evolve into loving, serving, helping, encouraging, and laying down your life for other people. So you don't have to be an apostle to be called to walk in love, to put first the kingdom of God, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. But as I said, I think it was last week or the week before, to really love people requires effort on your part. It's, it takes effort. There is no such thing as, as effortlessness when it comes to loving your neighbor. <laughs> Just try to love your neighbor. Some people, it's an effort just to love their spouse. Now, why would that be? Why is it so difficult to love others? Because you can't love others when you are in love with your own self. So wrapped up in that great commandment of Christ to love God and to love your neighbor, the only way that can happen is if you take up the cross, deny yourself, and follow after Jesus. Because the self-centered person will never love God and will never love their neighbor more than they love their own self. The very essence of love is that it gives, it pours out, it serves and does it with joy. In the same way that a nursing mother is cherishing her child and would do anything to protect that child and care for that child, that is spiritual maturity illustrated at the very highest level. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, Paul says, yet have not love it, I am but a sounding brass and a tinkling symbol. Faith that can move mountains, understand prophecy and all, all the mysteries. But if I don't have love, even if I give my body to be burned, if I don't have love, it profits me nothing. It means nothing. And that love will cause a person to labor and to toil night and day. Verse 9, you remember, brethren, our labor and toil. Listen, they were not lazy people. They were not just resting in Christ, quote, unquote. They weren't sitting around waiting for the Lord to do something. They labored and toiled night and day. Laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. Elsewhere, Paul says, we worked with our own two hands. All the others came around saying, you need to support us because we're doing the work of the Lord. We're the apostle. We've been sent by God. We don't have time to work. All we do is preach. All we do is teach. And besides that, we're the leaders. So you go out, you work, then you bring us the offerings and the tithes and support us. Paul says, nope, you remember us, we work night and day. 
so we wouldn't be a burden to you so we could preach the gospel. Verse 10, you are witnesses in God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. Here's another high apostolic standard, blameless behavior. Blameless behavior. Every day we see Examples in the nightly news of yet another preacher caught up in a scandal doing something he wasn't supposed to do. There's one just this week, well known, I'm not going to say his name because that's not the point. Drunk driving, television preacher, mugshot on the internet. And the world laughs, the world mocks. And why shouldn't they? That's the example that's being sent forth by the harlot church, representing Jesus, representing the Lord. And that's, that's how it gets represented to the world. You say, well, Brother Chip, you just said nobody's perfect and we're all going to sin and fall short of the glory of God. Yeah, but that's different from living a life in total disregard for walking worthy. We need to hold ourselves to a higher standard. We're going to be accountable for our actions, particularly those who put themselves out as leaders, supposed to be the representation of God in the earth. Blameless. Well, all of this leads up to walking worthy. Verse 11, as you know how we exhorted and comforted, and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. He's changed the analogy. You notice that. He's used the example of a nursing mother who cherishes her own children. Now he's using the example of a father who comforts, teaches, warns, instructs his own children. To what end? To what purpose? Why is Paul doing all of this? Verse 12, that you should walk worthy, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And this is why I'm saying, even though it's the apostolic example, it's not for apostles only. Paul is holding himself up as an example, not of how an apostle should be, but as an example of how they should be living. This isn't just a higher standard for apostles to follow, he says. He says, we're giving you an example so that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So this is an example of how all of us should walk worthy of this kingdom. And what does this have to do with the return of Jesus? Well, it has to do with the fact that when the Lord returns at a day and a time when we don't know, the rhetorical question that he asked is when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith in the earth? And as I pointed out in a previous message, the word faith there it includes belief, but it's not limited to belief. Jesus is not rhetorically asking, will I find people who believe in me when I return? What he is asking is, when, I, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faithfulness in the earth? 
Will there be any faithful people when I return? See, he's returning no matter what. You say, well, he's waiting for the, a, a pure bride. He's only returning for a pure bride. No, he, he's returning whether the bride's ready or not. That's the whole point of the parable. Get it through your head. Read the parables of the kingdom. He doesn't wait until everybody has got everything just perfect, and then he returns. That's the exact opposite of what he taught in his parables. The parables are some people are ready and some people are not. And he's not talking about the world. He's talking about servants, some who are good and faithful. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And to another servant, not somebody out in the world, but another servant, he says, you wicked, lazy, unprofitable servant. And he gets cast out. And there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then there's the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. Five were ready. They were prepared. They had the oil in their lamp. And the other five were foolish. They weren't ready. They weren't prepared. They weren't faithful. That's the message. So I don't know where people got the idea that Jesus is only coming back for a perfect bride. Oh, his bride has to be perfect, has to be spotless, sinless perfection. Well, if that's the case, it's no wonder that it's taken 2,000 years. And from my perspective, it's getting worse, not better. And so his coming is getting more and more delayed. And that's not what Scripture teaches. It says, Behold, I come quickly. I come as a thief in the night. Watch and pray. Be ready. Be faithful. That's the message of Scripture, that we should walk worthy because Jesus is returning. And we want to be found faithful we want to be among those who are good and faithful servants when he returns. Not wicked, lazy, unprofitable servants. Now that's what Jesus called them. I'm just quoting what he said. You can read the scripture and you can, you can see the same thing I'm seeing. So the example that Paul is giving them, and I, I called it the apostolic example, because it was an apostolic example, it was an example of the apostle Paul, but he's saying we live this way to give you an example so that you could follow our example and walk worthy. It's not a higher standard for apostles and then, well, it's acceptable for people who don't think they're apostles or who aren't called to do that. It's okay for them to be a little more loose. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the case at all. So as believers in Christ, as faithful followers of the Lord who want to be found faithful when he returns, we walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. That's why when people say, well, Brother Chip, if everything's going to be gathered up into Christ, like you're saying, and if everyone eventually is going to be saved in the end, then why preach the gospel? We can just do whatever we want to do. No, we can't. We preach the gospel because Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And you don't know how everything is going to turn out anyway. So that's a lazy, unprofitable servant who only wants to live it up, eat, drink, and be merry, and not have any responsibility. And they call that freedom in Christ. No, it's not. That's just catering to your flesh. That's all that is. Don't be misled. Paul says, we labored and we toiled night and day. And it gets tired, tiring. It's tiresome. It's hard on your flesh. But that's just the way it is. Who else is going to do it? Who else is going to be faithful? We need to stop relying on everyone else being faithful. And we have to set the standard. You and I have to do it. We have to be the example. 
so that when Jesus returns, he finds some faithful people someplace. He finds a remnant somewhere. So that's our calling as believers, to walk worthy of his kingdom. Verse 13, for this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So get this, they receive the word of God. And that word of God is effectively working in them because they believe and they are faithful to that message. But then look what happens. Spiritual conflict. We're back to that spiritual conflict again. And you might as well get yourself ready and prepared. As Paul told Timothy, they who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And you know a big aspect of this teaching on the return of Jesus is whether or not God's people will go through the tribulation. If there is such a thing as a seven year tribulation, which I think that's open for discussion. But assuming that there is, as most people do, the question then becomes, will Jesus return and, and rapture the church? My question would be, which church are you talking about? But will Jesus return and rapture the church before the tribulation or will we go through the tribulation? And I think that the real question there is, will I have to suffer? Will I have to go through persecution? Will I have to experience these terrible things? But those who know God and those who know the word of God know that you can count upon spiritual conflict and you can count upon the fact that in this world you will have tribulation. And you can count upon the fact that all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Is it the great tribulation? I don't know. But I think we need to go deeper and we need to ask ourselves, are we prepared for spiritual conflict? Are you spiritually where you need to be in the Lord if you should be called to go through great tribulation? Would you endure to the end to be saved? Or would you be totally knocked off course, so disillusioned and so disappointed that you had to suffer a little bit for your faith? that you end up falling away. I don't have the answer for you tonight about the Great Tribulation, if there is such a thing, but I can tell you this. We are in the midst of spiritual conflict. We are in the midst of spiritual warfare. It's not coming. It's already here. And if you think it's in the future, then your eyes have not been opened to the reality of what is happening in the spiritual realm. There is a spiritual conflict, and I think Paul illustrates it for us nicely here, that as soon as they receive the word of God, he says, you brethren, verse 14, became imitators of the churches of God, the ecclesias of God, which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. That's a way of him saying, the ecclesias in Judea, it means the, the brothers and sisters who are believers in Jesus and yet, or I should say they have come from a Jewish background, Jerusalem and Judea. So these are the Jewish Christians as opposed to the Gentile Christians of which Thessal Thessalonica is a Greek population, so they would be considered Gentiles. The Ecclesias of God in Judea, 
are they Jewish Christians? Now, some of them were still in the Jewish religion. Others of them had, had come out of the Jewish religion because of persecution. And they began to realize, I can't hang on to the religious system and hang on to my faith in Jesus. At the same time, they're not compatible. And I would suggest to you that the exact same thing is happening today, that people are realizing they cannot hang on to their faith in Christ and their relationship with the Lord so long as they are still clinging to a religion about Jesus. The relationship with Jesus always suffers. A religion about Jesus has effectively been substituted for a true relationship with him. Religion or relationship. That's what it comes down to. And that's what it came down to for those brothers and sisters in Judea. They had to make a choice because as much as they loved the people and they loved their Jewish history and they loved the temple, they couldn't love all those things and still call Jesus Lord. Because religion rejected Jesus as Lord. The religious system of their day. And so Paul says, verse 14 again, halfway through that verse, For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans. In other words, the religious system persecuted the believers in Jesus. The religious system who claimed to represent God persecuted the Son of God. Now look at how it progresses. Verse 15, he says, They killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. They have persecuted us, and they do not please God, and are contrary to all men. <laughs> right? Is that not the essence of the spirit of religion? It's the essence of the spirit of Antichrist coming forth as God and representing God and yet opposing God the whole time. Verse 15, they killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they do not please God and are contrary to all men. Not only that, verse 16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. So always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. The judgment of God is on the harlot church. The judgment of God is on the spirit of religion. And that judgment of God is on the Christian religion more so than any other religion. And why is that? Why would the judgment of God be harsher and more punishing and more severe on the Christian religion, I'm talking about the harlot church, as opposed to the Buddhist religion or the Mormon or the Islam religion or Hinduism. Because these other religions are not claiming to represent the Lord Jesus. And when you claim to represent the Lord Jesus, and yet you misrepresent him, God is going to do something to preserve and protect and sanctify the testimony of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that there is no judgment for any of these other religions. But I'm saying judgment begins in the house of God. It begins in the family of God. And God is going to deal most strictly with those who claim to represent him and yet oppose him. And that's why Jesus, speaking to the Pharisees, speaking to the leaders of his day, he said, you hypocrites, how will you escape the damnation of hell? The kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to another nation who will bring forth the fruits thereof. So look at, look at the essence of this spiritual conflict. First of all, you should know that 
there are hindrances to walking worthy. Why is it so difficult to walk worthy? Why is it so hard? <laughs> well, if it was easy, everybody would do it. And you wouldn't have to have Scripture reminding us and teaching us that we have a stewardship. We have a responsibility to walk worthy of our calling. If it was easy, everybody would do it. But there are hindrances to walking worthy. They're not insurmountable. You can overcome them. That's what Jesus is telling his people in the book of Revelation, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes. So there are hindrances to walking worthy, but you can overcome them. These hindrances, however, are religious. It's not something out in the world that's going to hinder you. You may think it is, and that's what the harlot church teaches you. The harlot church teaches you you're only safe inside the harlot church. You're only, you got to save yourself from the world by coming to church. Shut out the world and close yourself in with us and you'll be safe. <laughs> but what you should know is that these hindrances to walking worthy, living a life that is Christ-centered, focused on relationship and not religion, following after the spirit instead of following after man, to live that kind of life, you're going to have hindrances, but those hindrances are not coming to you out in the world, from the world. They're coming to you from the religious spirit. It's that spirit of religion, the spirit of Antichrist, that is doing anything it can to keep you from walking in a Christ-centered spiritual maturity. So these hindrances in your, in your life that are, that are going to distract you and hinder you from the Lord, they're religious. And these hindrances are motivated by the spirit of Antichrist, which means against Christ, yet representing Christ. It's a very interesting word, that word, Antichristos. It doesn't just mean coming against Jesus. It means imitating Jesus and yet opposing Jesus. Claiming to be Jesus and yet really being against him. And that's where the deception is. That's why it's so, it is so seducing, this harlot church. That's why it's a harlot. Harlots are, sedu are, are seducers. They are seductresses. Harlots know how to entice and how to bring you in and bring you in and get you to indulge. That's what harlots do. So the, the harlot church is the greatest hindrance to the simplicity of Christ. And that's the essence of this spiritual conflict. Recognizing Antichrist. First of all, we said it's a religious spirit. It's not a worldly spirit. It's not some satanic, demonic thing. It's a religious spirit. And it's a religious spirit that shows up in religious people. Secondly, we recognize the spirit of Antichrist because it killed the Lord Jesus. What does that mean prophetically? I'm going to give you a prophetic interpretation of verse 15. It's the spirit of Antichrist who does what? Killed the Lord Jesus. How does the spirit of Antichrist kill the Lord Jesus today? By coming against the Lord's people who bear the testimony of Jesus. That is the point of conflict in the book of Revelation and in the day and in the time that we live in. It is the truth concerning Jesus that inspires the prophetic word. It's the testimony of Jesus. And so the spirit of Antichrist is trying to prevent the truth concerning Jesus from getting out into the world. It would prefer to have lies about Jesus. It would prefer to have a religion about Jesus, not the truth concerning Jesus. A religion concerning Jesus, that's acceptable. 
because that's a falsehood. But the truth concerning Jesus that is anti-religion, that's not going to work. And who's coming against that? Not the world, but the religious, <laughs> the harlot church. I hope you see it. I hope you grasp it. And if you get it, share this message with somebody else. And you'll quickly find out where they are. You'll see the spirit of Antichrist rising up, defending their church, defending their pastor, defending the harlot system. But it's that very system that kills the testimony of Jesus. So do you see that application there? Then it says, they kill their own prophets. So if it's the if it's the testimony of Jesus inspires the prophetic word, that means it is the prophetic word that explains and reveals and proclaims the truth concerning Jesus. So that spirit of Antichrist comes against the prophetic men and women, prophetic calling, the prophetic word, the prophetic utterance. And the way it does it is to flood us and overwhelm us and bury us under an avalanche of a lot of idiots speaking prophetic things they don't have a clue what prophecy is, don't have a clue what the testimony of Jesus is, and they are false prophets. What better way to confuse and distract and hinder the testimony of Jesus than to put a lying spirit in the mouths of all these carnal, immature, self-centered, false prophets and then use the Internet to spread these false prophetic sayings and words and dreams and visions, and keep people so wrapped up in the prophetic, the prophetic, they say, the prophetic. And we exalt the prophetic, and we worship the prophetic, and we bow down to the prophetic as if it's something important. When all it is is a golden calf that people can stand up and they can blather about, and speak things out of their head, and try to impress people with a pseudo-spirituality, and completely miss the fact that it is the testimony of Jesus that inspires the prophetic word. It's the truth concerning Jesus. It's not all this other garbage. That's not prophetic. It's pathetic. There's a difference between the prophetic word that testifies and points people to Jesus, and the pathetic that counterfeits itself as prophetic. And you better know the difference. And I think most of you do. So I'm speaking for the benefit of, of those who need some extra guidance in that area. It's the spirit of Antichrist. Killed the Lord Jesus, which means he's it's coming against the testimony of Jesus. Killed their own prophets trying to destroy the prophetic word, and in our case, drown out the true prophetic voice from being heard by flooding us with all kinds of false prophetic words, false dreams, false visions, false preachers, false signs and wonders, trying to deceive the very elect. And the Internet is just a tool. The tool is only as good and it's only as useful as the craftsman who uses the tool. And so in the hands of the, of the true remnant, it's a valuable tool. In the hands of the false prophetic, in the hands of the harlot church, it is a tool that wreaks havoc and destruction and death and quenches the life of God's people. It absolutely starves them for the true prophetic word. But that's the, that's the time that we live in. It's just a tool, this Internet, a tool for communication, 
It's what you do with it that matters. It can be a tool for great good. It can be a tool to help. It can be a tool to get the true testimony of Jesus out into the earth. And it's also a tool where error and heresy and false prophetic can go forth and multiply and multiply like a virus. And it's the blindness and spiritual stupidity of the spiritually retarded who never grew up but are stunted in their growth that eagerly listen to and drink in and swallow it all and only when it's too late do they realize that it's not the spirit of God behind it all it's not the spirit of Christ, it's the spirit of Antichrist. Well, I hope that's not a revelation to you. It should be a confirmation of what you already know to be true. But if you disagree or if that's not your experience, you come spend some time with me and I'll tell you some stories. What's the fourth way we recognize Antichrist? And the, and the last way, as I conclude... They persecuted the apostles and forbade them to speak. Now, I want you to see this progression here. You start by attacking the testimony of Jesus. Attack the truth concerning Jesus. Put out whatever you want to that's false about Jesus. We can even talk about Jesus. We can do things in his name. We can teach in his name. We can do good works in his name. As long as we're not really speaking the truth concerning Jesus, it's all right. From as far as the spirit of Antichrist is concerned. Just don't tell people the truth about him. You can talk, you can talk about him. He's a good teacher. He was a good prophet. But let's don't tell people the truth concerning Jesus. So that's the attack on the testimony of Jesus. And then the spirit of Antichrist attacks the prophetic. The true prophetic word, the true prophetic men and women. And that's a, an entirely different teaching on what constitutes true and false prophetic. But the fact of the matter is, the truth concerning Jesus is what inspires the prophetic word. The prophetic word brings the revelation of Christ and the truth concerning Jesus. So if you don't have that prophetic word coming through true prophetic men and women who can speak the truth concerning Jesus, then the truth concerning Jesus doesn't get out. It's not revealed. It's not being spoken. It's not being proclaimed as I'm proclaiming it to you tonight. So the spirit of Antichrist loves to attack and come against the genuine prophetic. And if it can't shut them up, then it can at least move upon the carnal and the fleshly and the self-centered and those who are following a different spirit to flood the body of Christ with false messages, create static and confusion and disharmony. And so people are confused and the prophetic word is quenched. And then people are so sick of hearing it, they quench the prophetic word altogether, and they don't even want to hear it. Well, mission accomplished for the spirit of Antichrist when it gets to that point. When it gets to the point where all people want to hear is good, positive, encouraging, edifying, lift me up, make me feel good preaching. And if that's what they want to hear, then the prophetic word has died and the spirit of Antichrist has won the battle. And that's why, in order to speak the truth concerning Jesus, we have to maintain the testimony and the integrity of God's word, not to be man-pleasers, but to be God-pleasers. And that means conflict with the spirit of Antichrist, manifesting itself through the harlot church and the religious spirit. Well, then finally, 
This spirit of Antichrist persecutes the apostles and tries to shut them up, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved. And I have in parentheses there the ecclesia. So, kill the Lord Jesus represents trying to destroy the testimony, the truth concerning Jesus. Kill their own apostles in our time represents trying to quench the prophetic word. Persecuted the apostles and the spirit of Antichrist still does that. How does that affect the ecclesia? It's an attack on spiritual leadership, an attack on spiritual fathers and mothers. If you kill the parents... The children are orphans, and they have no example, and they have no one to instruct them, and they have no one to watch over them. And people say, well, Brother Jesus is, is in charge of his church. He's the head of the church, and he can watch over them and keep them. Well, that's true, and certainly he can. But the way he does it is through men and women, fathers and mothers, elders, those who are older in the Lord, to watch after, protect, train, teach, help those who are younger. That's the way he ordained it. That's not the way I would do it. I would take men out of it altogether and just say, Jesus, you, you manage everything directly. I don't trust myself, and I don't trust other people to be in a position of having to be an example for everybody else. It's too much responsibility to give to a person. But that's not the way God did it. He said, no, it has to be set up like a family. It's got to be a family. And in the family, you have those who are elder and you have those who are younger. And those who are elder are supposed to serve those who are younger, watch over them, protect them, encourage them, look after them, and help them to grow. So if you persecute the apostles, which represents the spiritual leadership, the servant leadership, not the false leadership of the harlot church, but the true laying down your life, as we saw tonight, as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. That's the kind of leadership that true apostles provide to the ecclesia so that the body of Christ can grow and not be children anymore, but can grow up into maturity. And if you quench that, if you come against that, if you persecute that and cut that off and make people Get people with the mindset that I don't need anybody to tell me anything. I don't need teaching. I don't need leadership. I don't need any example to follow. Jesus is everything. He's all that I need. And that's true to a certain extent. It is true. But you have to recognize that Jesus uses men and women. He uses you. He uses me. He uses all of us working together as the body of Christ. And so we can't say... Because I'm a part of the body of Christ, I don't need you. On the contrary, the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. The foot can't say to the hand, I don't need you. We could all just say, all we need is the head. But that's not the case. It says that we are many members but one body, and we all need one another. But when you take away the parents, you destroy the future of the children. Spiritually speaking, that's what the spirit of Antichrist is trying to do. By persecuting the apostles, those who are the fathers and the mothers, cherishing, nourishing the children so that they can grow up into a Christ-centered spiritual walk, when you take that out, take that away, what happens to the children? They don't grow. And that's exactly why the harlot church is prospering and thriving by keeping people in a state of spiritual retardation, stunted growth, immature, still carnal, not growing, perpetually, perpetually weak. So that's why we have to recognize that tendency. And we have to realize that we are in the midst of spiritual conflict and we have to rise up and overcome in the power of Christ. Because I believe that the power of Christ is greater than the power of Antichrist. 
Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound, and greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Verse 17 says, But we, brethren, having been taking, taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. There is that spirit of religion and that conflict trying to come against the testimony of Jesus, trying to come against everything that Paul is doing to encourage them and grow them up and point them to Christ. And yet, time and again, he says, Satan has hindered us from coming to you. What an amazing statement. It's, it shows that there is a battle that's going on here. That's why it's not easy. There's nothing about this that is easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. The simplicity of Christ in maintaining the testimony of Jesus, serving others, loving God and loving your neighbor. It's not going to come without any opposition. Even I, Paul, time and again, he says, tried to come to you, but Satan hindered us. That's a wake-up call. But every time Satan hindered Paul, I think it set Paul to prayer. It set Paul to seeking the face of the Lord. It set Paul to realize that the outward man is perishing, but the inward man is getting stronger every day. And even in my weakness, his grace is sufficient, is sufficient. And so he kept on and kept on and kept on. And that's what you have to do. Keep on and keep on and keep on. You meet with a little difficulty, you don't give up. You don't say it's too hard. You just keep on. Keep pressing on, pressing on, pressing on towards the mark for the goal of the high call of God in Christ. So Satan is going to hinder, but he can't prevent. That's the, the thing to keep in mind. Verse 19, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? What keeps us? What keeps you motivated, Paul? Why do you keep on going even when Satan tries to hinder you? He says, because you are our hope and our joy and our crown of rejoicing. Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. And that's the thing that kept Paul motivated. It kept him going when others would quit because he had a great vision of what those believers in Christ were going to be if they would walk worthy they would be with him in the presence of the Lord Jesus at his coming and that's the thing that motivated Paul and it ought to be the thing I think that motivates you and I to walk worthy of God and of his kingdom and to be faithful to the testimony of Jesus and the gospel that has been entrusted to us. So a couple of takeaways for you tonight, and I know I've gone over and I apologize for that, but uh, that's the way it is. Takeaway number one, while waiting for the return of Christ, we must walk worthy of his kingdom. I think that is self-evident from everything we've discussed tonight. And then takeaway number two, expect opposition to the testimony of Jesus and proclaim him anyway. Expect opposition to the truth concerning Jesus, but don't let that stop you from being bold in the midst of much conflict. Don't wait for it to get easier because it's not. If anything, it's going to get harder. But you can get bitter or you can get better. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's the truth concerning Jesus, and that's what the body of Christ is here to represent in the earth. And it's what we are to do while we wait for the return of the Lord Jesus.